honest, it is a privilege for me to stand here before you. Of course, I know we've probably, uh, if you've kept up with the news much at all over the past week, we now see that everybody's scrambling. Anybody that's ever held office has probably went back through and looked at every record they have to make sure it's not a classified document. Uh, and that's and that's okay because I I seen an interview with Senator Rand Paul and I didn't realize that even the menu at the White House is considered a classified document. So if you go down that far to classify something, it's possible that you could have served on a committee that that had a document that was classified and you didn't realize that it would be considered as such. And I'm not trying to give anybody a, a pass. I'm just saying there's with our government. The, the number of documents they have is so vast that uh, it doesn't surprise me. I just hope that nothing has been compromised as far as our uh, national security uh, on those. But no doubt uh, they've been doing an inventory. Uh, and I imagine if the truth were to be told, uh, there's a lot of documents in places that they shouldn't be. Uh, and uh, Christians, we think about that in the, in in a loose term. You know, we have a similar situation with how we handle uh, God's word. Uh, another thing that we may not all realize uh, is that when we hold this document, this Bible, which is not classified, by the way, though some of us sometimes treat it as a classified document. It's not a classified document. It's open to all of the public to be read and encouraged to do so. But also, with that in mind, we may not realize that as having this document and being a Christian, that means that we are ministers. That we are all, all Christians are ministers. So the title of this morning's sermon and what I want to talk about this morning is what is your ministry? What is your ministry? And if you look up on the slide, hopefully uh, that doesn't see uh, to come out as well. But that's a guy standing there, looks like Kevin off of off of Home Alone, with his hands on his cheeks and saying, "You want me to do what?" And that's right. I want you to consider yourself because I know many of us do not consider ourselves ministers. We'll consider ourselves Christians. But we do not consider ourselves to be a minister. Well, I want us to change because as I have been talking about the past couple of weeks, how that I want us to begin to reach out to the community and reach out to those that, well, maybe once came to church and for whatever reason they're not here, or maybe for those that have never come to church because they've never had the gospel shared with them, that I want us to begin to uh, reach out to those that need the Lord. Far too many of us as Christians believe that ministry is just for the preacher. The preacher alone. Well, that's, he's the minister. He, that's his job. He's the minister. That's what he's supposed to take care of. He's the minister. Well, I think that we can look at some, some scripture here that will back up that every member of the body of Christ is a minister. And that every one of us has been equipped to do something, some kind of ministry. Each and every one of us have been equipped to do that. If you will, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 11 and 12, is where we're going to begin this morning's study. And uh, we're going to look at the writings of Paul throughout this sermon today. And I wanted to to do this particular sermon because of because of what's going to go on next Sunday with Randy and how that he has come forward to be a, uh, a deacon. And this just shows us that we all have a place. Paul here is writing to the church at Ephesus. He's talking about how that we are all unified through the Spirit. And in verse 11 he says, and talking about Christ and the work of Christ, the fact that he came and he ascended back for those reasons, he says this, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And he writes, talking about that, not just a small select group of people, though we're going to talk about that select group that we call preachers as ministers. But when he is addressing the church at Ephesus and talking about this group that that how that some of these folks have different jobs, and, and we know that there's several other passages, and we'll look at those this morning. It talks about all of us, that we all have some type of talent, some type of blessing to serve in some area of ministry. So let's begin with the most popular one. When everyone, anyone asks, who's your minister up there at Locust Grove, the first thing the answer is going to come out is going to, they're going to say Rob Hale's the minister up there. When in reality, for today, we have 50. In the past, we've had in the 60s and we've started off in the 70s. I hope that's not a trend, by the way. We should be able to say that every Christian at Locust Grove is a minister in some area. And I think that if we decide in our hearts and decide to get our minds on board, we can do this as a congregation. And because I think it's what the Bible teaches us. Well, I don't think. I know. I know it's what the Bible teaches us, and I know it's what God would have us to do. So first, let's look at this fellow we call the preacher. Verse 12. Here's what the preacher does. He, per, he does things to perfect the saints for the work of ministry to edify the body of Christ. Perfecting, some of yours will say, some translations will say, instead of perfecting, it says equipping. Preacher's job is to equip the body of Christ to serve so that Christ's name can be glorified. That's what the preacher does. Now, preachers do many other things. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to narrow their job description. But what I want us to understand is we as Christians sitting out there have oftentimes narrowed our own job description as just to being a Christian, which means I just show up, which is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible doesn't teach us just to show up. So when we think about preachers, we preachers preach the word. I think that I try to do that every Sunday. Anytime I enter this pulpit, anytime we teach on Wednesday nights, it's the truth of God's word. It also helps people overcome areas in your life that may be preventing you from serving in your ministry. Helping to equip you, helping to lift you up so that you are able to fulfill what God has intended for you to do through the talent that he has blessed you with. That's the job of a minister also. So in those areas are very, very important. And I have always tried to, with sermons, either it be an encouraging sermon or be a sermon that was thought-provoking so that we would be examining ourselves or a type of sermon that maybe warned us of potential behavior that would damage our ministry. I think you can find in about any sermon I've ever preached, it fits pretty much into one of those three categories. So that's the minister's job, is to help equip you to serve in your ministry. So preachers are called to develop these skills, to help identify the area that you can serve and how you can be effective in the ministry, to take your talent and to plug it into something within the congregation where you can serve and encourage you in that area and to help you succeed because it is ultimately God who has equipped you to do that. And the preacher's job has evolved over the years to do many other things, and that's okay. But it's important to realize that as preachers, we and Christians share a common responsibility, and that is to serve God with the talent that he's given to each of us for the sole reason to bring glory to the kingdom, to lift up Christ as our Savior. We all have that common purpose in what we do. We come to church so that we can be built up to go out and perform our ministry. 
And that's how we need to view church, and that's how we need to understand. When we understand that, then we can help people to understand that may have a misconception of why we gather and what we do whenever we come together. So that's the job of the preacher, as we would have it, traditionally to think about that. So some of you may be thinking, now, so where do I fit in, Rob? Where is it that I fit in? How is it that, that I can do this? And, and you can go online and do all kinds of surveys that tell you where you're best suited to, to serve. But I feel like that through prayer and through our own knowledge of ourselves, we're already a pretty good job, judge of what we're able to do, what I'm, what I'm good at. What is it that I can do that I'm pretty good at? Well, that's probably the area that you can serve in as well. Let's look at something else that will help you about where do you fit in. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. Paul here, of course, is writing to the church at Rome. For as we have many members, he says, and we would agree with that. We have many, we have many members here, and we let's just take this a little bit at a time. Think about our membership here. We have a diverse group of people uh, that, from age, a broad diverse of age groups. We have a broad and diverse group of people that have a lot of life experience. We have people that have worked professionally and are working professionally. We have retirees. We have people that are actively working a job. We have people that, Christians that are actively in school. We have business owners. We have retired business owners. We have people that have worked in the public sector. We have people that worked in the private sector. We have people that have been a Christian for a long time. We have people that have been a Christian for a short period of time. We have people here who are not Christians. So we have a broad and diverse group of people that meet, meet here. We, as he says here in verse 4, as we have many members, we are one body. And all members have not the same office. So we're not all going to be doing the same thing. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And these are just a few of the things. These are just a few of the things that we see. Serving, teaching, encouraging, giving money, being uh, over, managing kind of things. And that's a few of the things. Now let me ask you this, and I want you to give serious consideration to these questions that I ask. What are you good at? What is it that you're good at? Are you a good singer? Then let singing be your ministry. And I'm not saying necessary to be a song leader, but when you're out there singing, sing with a good voice, a strong voice, so that the others that may not sing as well like me would be encouraged to sing more. Maybe whenever we have a call to have a choir come up, you say, well, singing is my ministry. They're having a choir. That sounds like a match made in heaven. And it is. And that's just an example if you're a good singer. Uh, for those of us that are not good singers, then I don't recommend that you sing for your ministry. Because you've got something else you can do. What about if you're good with, uh, with working with your hands? Tools fit naturally in those things. And you can do wonderful things. It's a crime what I do to a piece of wood sometimes. I mean, I get it to do what I need it to do, but 
there's men that have much better talent about cutting angles and takeoffs and such. But if you're good at that, use that talent to serve God in some way. Maybe you're good with computers. Maybe you're good with finances. Maybe you're good with cooking. And the list could go on and on and on, but I hope you get the idea. And you may ask, well, Rob, what does cooking have to do with a ministry? Well, when you think about it on just on the surface, really nothing. But what if you took a young wife that maybe was a young Christian and you started a some kind of cooking ministry, how to make biscuits 101? Because there's a lot of people out there who don't know how to make biscuits. Maybe you make really good biscuits. And you come together over here. We have the facilities to do this. And these are just ideas. And you teach these young people, whether it's young married wives or uh, the wives that's been wives for a long time and just can't make a good biscuit. But you teach them how to make a biscuit. Well, you've helped that home. You've helped lift her esteem up as a wife. And aren't we called to uh, the older to help the younger? And maybe you've opened up an opportunity for while you're pounding out that dough and mixing those ingredients together, maybe you're going to open that relationship up to where they say to you, you know, I'm having a little problem in a different area of the life. Nothing to do with the biscuit. Nothing to do with how hot the oven has to be and how long you put those dudes in there. But maybe you have that opportunity because you're good at cooking and you're teaching someone a skill that will help them throughout their life, but you may also be able to help them with a present problem that they need to deal with and they don't know how. That's how cooking can be part of a ministry. In the same way with finances. Maybe you, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're a retired accountant. Maybe you kept books for a living. Maybe you are excellent at balancing a checkbook and showing how to manage a checkbook. Of course, that's just about a thing of the past today because everybody uses debit cards. But there's some people that still are old school that, that log in the register and stuff. Maybe you're good at doing those types of things and someone needs help in learning how to do that, make a budget for their house. There's lots of opportunities that we have through the talents that God has blessed us with to use those, if not a ministry direct, as an indirect way to build a relationship with someone. So that's where you can fit in. That's where ministry opens many doors. It doesn't necessarily mean that you carry your Bible around and preach to people. No, that's not what call is called being Christ to those. Because how did Christ open the door? Didn't he open the door by meeting people's needs? No, there's no examples in there where he taught somebody how to bake a biscuit. But what's wrong with teaching someone how to bake a biscuit if you can use that as an opportunity to present the gospel to them? To be Christ to them. To help them through a difficult time in their life that will help them later on down the road with their relationship with the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I think we can find ourselves, we put ourselves in too narrow a box into thinking that how that we can use our relationship with Christ to serve others. And I think it's time that we opened that box up, took the lid off, threw the lid away, and begin to broaden what we do to reach out to people. Ministry, or the minister, is defined as this. This is the verb part. To give help, to serve. Now, when you look at it in those terms, can you see how that you could be a minister yourself? If you're there to give help and to serve, then we can see that whatever area that we are talented in, that we could use that as a ministry to give help and to serve. So what is your ministry? And the last part that we'll look at this morning, over in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians to be exact, chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Now this whole chapter, really, and if you 
if this has piqued your interest, I encourage you to read chapter 12 through this week. Add that to your extra Bible reading. But listen to what Paul writes here to the church at Corinth in verses 12, 13, 14. And again, having to do with a group but being different. It says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all of the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bound or free, or have all been made to drink of one, into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And I think this is the slide where I have the Mr. Potato Head up there. And I never really thought about incorporating Mr. Potato Head into the sermon, but this is an excellent opportunity. Most of us are familiar at one time, whether we had a Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head of our own, you know that you had all kinds of pieces that you could assemble Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head. Different lips, different eyes, that type of thing. But you only had one Mr. Potato Head, however you dressed them up. And that's what the uniqueness of each congregation is. No, I'm not saying you're Potato Heads. But what I am saying is, is this. I'm saying that we have a diversity of things that we can plug into this congregation that we can do as a body. And we do that excellent. We do that right now. And I'm not saying we need to do more, but we do. Because we do this wonderful thing. Lisa does this wonderful uh, Operation Christmas Child. We do trunk or treat. And, and I could go over all the lists. You know, Bible release time. We do that. We reach out and do many great and wonderful things. But if you look at the roster of people that work at these ministries we have, it's not 50, and it's not 40, and it's not 30. It's less than 20 people that do all of these ministries in the church. So there's plenty of opportunity for people that are not involved in a ministry to get involved in a ministry. And that's what we have to, to remember. What is your ministry? And that's a simple fact. That when you are baptized, when you're raised that new creation in Christ, and this is something that we need to begin to teach to our young people, because it is the truth. When you're, when you're raised up out of that water, as that new man or new woman in Christ, you are ordained into the ministry at that point. Now, I'm not talking about an ordination service like we will have here that sets someone apart for a specific job in, in the church, uh, elder, preacher, deacon. But I'm saying that when you are created, that new creation in Christ, you are ordained to operate in the name of Christ for the glory of Christ in whatever area God has blessed you in. That's your ordination service, so to speak. And that's how we need to look at it. Here's another thought I want you to consider. Now, I want you to really consider these questions. If you're not serving in a ministry right now, who is serving in that ministry for you? Because it's being done. It's just you're not doing it. Someone else is having to do part of their ministry and to do yours as well. We don't often think of those, do we? We don't ever think of that. We don't ever think about the fact that I'm not doing what God talent has given me talent to do. So somebody else is going to have to take up the slack. Because God's work is going to be done. God's will is going to be done. Those ministries are going to be done. You're just not being taken part in it, okay? So, though we've never really thought about that, I think it's good that we should. Here's another thought. Who, because you're not doing your, your ministry, who's not getting the help that they need? Who is not coming in contact with you and the talent that you have that God gave you 
that needs to hear about needs to hear benefit of your talent. We don't think about it that way either, do we? We think that it is a victimless crime, so to speak, that we don't do anything in ministry. I'm not doing anything, so I'm not hurting anything. I'm not messing anything up. But you're also not serving anyone. And there may be someone out there that desperately needs what you have. But you're not giving it to them. So there's something to consider. What effect is it having by you not doing your ministry? And those are some pretty serious questions. I know and I understand. And I'm not trying to to beat nobody up and that's not my intent but what I want us to do is to think about these things because they're important it's what God expects us to do as ministers as well and I've said this in the past doing nothing is not a ministry and I want you to consider that and to be honest with yourself when you do. And, and imagine this. Imagine, imagine standing before God and what was your ministry, my child? I was the minister of nothing. Do you think that's going to be acceptable? I'm the minister of nothing? He doesn't have that in his book of talents. This person will be, shall be the minister of nothing. And when we look at it that way and we think about it, and I realize that's being kind of silly about things, but we honestly cherish, hold, love, cling to this ministry of nothing. And it's time we let this go. Many people are great ministers of nothing. Sometimes they're not even ministers of showing up. And that's not a ministry. Just showing up for church is not a ministry. Oh, it can be encouraging, motivating for other people, but it's not your ministry. Oh, I have a talent for going to church. What do you do when you get there? Oh, I'm the minister of nothing, but I go to church. See what I'm saying? And that, but we get caught in that mindset of things. And we get comfortable in that mindset of things because everything's going on. Things are getting done, so I'm comfortable as the minister of nothing. Because it doesn't really seem to have an effect because I do my job really well. Because things are continuing to be done. But it does have an effect. And that's what we have to know and understand. And I could stand here and I could ask a hundred different ways. I could give you a hundred different scenarios. But in reality, and I know this. <clears throat> I know this to be true. In reality, my words can only make you think at best. The Holy Spirit could convict you. But until you're convinced in your heart that God has given me a talent and he expects me to serve in ministry, that's what's going to make it to the stand. I'm just asking you to consider these things. I'm asking you to prayerfully ask God, if you don't know what your talent is, to ask God what your talent is. To show you in an area where you can serve in ministry. Remember what ministry is. It's not necessarily standing up here. And I'm not, I'm not ruling that out for anybody. Maybe you're called to preach. I encourage you to follow that call. Maybe you're called in some other area, and I encourage you to follow that just as strongly because that ministry for you is exactly what God had picked out for you. So I encourage you to consider those things because we all have an area to serve. So pray about it. Pray about it throughout the course of the week or the month or whatever and follow whatever the Lord leads you to do. And to begin that service... For us to serve, we have to follow after the example of Christ. By hearing and believing the word, accepting Jesus as our Savior, repenting of our sins, being baptized, 
raised that new creation after having received the forgiveness of, the, of our sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us in our life. We're raised that new creation, moving forward, serving and helping as ministers, your ordination service. From that day forward, you're a minister. Now, maybe some of you this morning realize, you know what? I've been a really good minister of nothing, and I need to change. But Rob's right. Rob showed me ample times in the scriptures that we all have a job to do, and I've not been doing anything. And I'll leave that between you and the Lord. And I rest assured there is something for you to do some way. So we're going to sing this hymn of invitation, Almost Persuaded. Almost Persuaded. Now to believe. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God has a ministry for you? Do you believe that God sent his only son so that you may have a hope of eternal life through his sacrifice, through the death, burial, and resurrection? If you believe those things and you have a decision that you want to make today, I want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing the first and the third verse, 178, almost persuaded. <laughs>